the situation is tr transformed within our society so much that Labour to be elected, they have to be radical because radical solutions are needed. John, firstly, what a huge pleasure in these quiet, tranquil times. There's so little to talk about. <laughs> this is a this is a relaxation, isn't it, from the fray? Very zen. <laughs> yeah, I feel this is this is our meditation during lockdown. Yeah, good uh, to see you. Anyway. Good to it's see you. very good, very good to see you, John, as well. Looking very healthy. Very uh, very neat haircut, unlike myself. <laughs> um, I'll just hit bam straight away. Mm -hmm. The left is all over. Situation we're in at the moment, I think, is a difficult period. There's no doubt about it. You know, having the loss of the election was brutal. It really was. And um, we went through, well, what I was surprised at, we went through a period of mourning, which is completely understandable. But what I've been quite pleasantly surprised at is that people bounce back very quickly. Um, of course, um, then the pandemic hit us. And I actually think, the pandemic has brought out the best in lots of people, you know, right the way across, not just the lay party members and socialists, but right the way across society where you've seen lots of people, mutual aid initiatives, supporting one another, and also people thinking much more contemplatively about the nature of our society and where we go from here. And to a certain extent, that's, um, that's had calmed down a bit because of this second lockdown, I think, has knocked people back a bit. But there's still that level of things have got to change. And that's the, I think that's the way in which the left can actually, socialists can then start talking about the nature of the society that we want. However, the travails within the Labour Party have definitely got worse with the treatment of Jeremy and his suspension and now bringing him back as a party member and then but not restoring the whip. But in some ways, the key thing now is to make sure that we hold people together um, the, for me, for people, stop people leaving the party. I can't, I, I can't come to terms with this to a certain extent. I know people, uh, some really wonderful people, like my former parliamentary private secretary, Thelma Walker, has just resigned. I've been trying to say to them, look, for a long time, <laughs> from the left, we were worried if the right took over, there would be a purge and would be kicked out. This is a self-purging that's going on. It's ludicrous. It's almost an act of self-harm. So I'm trying to say to people, stay, stick around, because I think we can overcome the issue with regard to Jeremy. Then the major battles will be around policy and the political direction of the party. So that's what we've got to gear up to. So in some ways, the left has been really is being really tested about are we really serious about socialist change in this country? Are we really serious about making sure the Labour Party is the vehicle for that change. So in some ways, it's been a bit rough, not as bad as I thought it could be. And now we're going into a much more serious phase in which I think sometimes it's down to grim determination to see yourself through these periods. But the good thing about it is, though, actually, there's a new generation that's come through. And, and it's just remarkable. They're so... They're so enthusiastic, but also so sophisticated in their understanding of the world and the way in which they depict it and the, the debates that take place, the, the sophistication of the language as well that's being used now. So I'm deeply encouraged. I'm also, you know, we, one of the ambitions I had a number of years ago was to make sure on the left, just as on the right at that point in time, there was an architecture of think tanks. We've now got on the left a massive architecture of think tanks bubbling with fresh ideas and mobilizing. We've also got so many elements of a social movement campaigning all the time, whether it's renters against evictions or whether it's Extinction Rebellion or whether it's young young people in terms of challenging the education experience that they've got. So no, I'm I'm you have to be optimistic if you're a socialist. The old Gramsci thing of, you know, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Um, I'm actually quite optimistic both in terms of the intellect as well as um, of the will as well as determination. So it's a rough, a difficult period, but I think we're going to come through it quite, well, I think quite welded together. New cadres coming forward who experienced, and as I say, with thinking, which is uh, radical breakthroughs in a number of areas, particularly around climate change, but also around equalities as well. I mean, 
the elephant in the room, which we can't ignore, is, of course, the suspension of Jeremy. I mean, it's Corbyn. And it's extraordinary, of course, because a year ago, he was standing to be the next prime minister. and He's now been suspended from his own party. I suppose just firstly, I mean, in terms of the statement, the initial statement on the day of the EHRC, what do you think about the anger it, it produced amongst some and then the reaction to it, of course, which was his suspension? Yeah. Look, we have to be honest, and, and I've been straight with Jeremy. The, the statement itself wasn't as carefully worded as it should have been. Um, but, you know, fair enough. But it, it wasn't as carefully worded as it should have been, and the timing wasn't brilliant. But, you know, the overreaction to it has just been staggering, really. And I think what's happened is there's been a sort of staggering level of blunders taking place and the overreaction um, has dug a hole for some people to fall into, and they keep on digging. This is, you know, what Jeremy has made it clear, you know, and I've said it time and time again. You know, we we made mistakes around anti-Semitism. We've admitted that. Jeremy's apologised time and time again. We made mistakes. We've admitted that, and now what we're trying to do is support care in tackling anti-Semitism in the way the HRC, Jeremy said he agrees with the recommendations. So now is not the time to be arguing about this. So we, we should be working together. So I just think there's been blunders and overreaction. And now we need to just, we just need to get on with the job, um, both in terms of tackling anti-Semitism, but, you know, we've also faced with a Tory government that is corrupt, incompetent, is costing people's lives, and also laying the plans for potential austerity in the future, uh, which will set us back again. Working class people will be the ones that they'll be forced to pay for the pandemic. And at the same time, but, you know, we're literally years away from the ca catastrophe of climate change, and we're running out of time. So they're all the issues we should be focused on now and just getting on with the job. So I'm I, I just want common sense to rule in the, in terms of the, the Labour Party leadership now and let us move on, for goodness sake, reinstate Jeremy in, in terms of the whip um, and just move on now. And also, if, if there are still disagreements around this issue, can't we just sit down in the same room and, and hammer it out in discussion and, and reach sensible compromises about the way forward? If I was Keir Starmer now, I'd simply invite... Jeremy in and Margaret Hodge in and say, look, can't we just lock the door, sit there and talk this through and resolve it and not leave the room until we do? And I think that's perfectly doable. Um, I mean, do you think on the one hand, the leadership suspension and refusal, sorry, to, to restore the whip has undermined the unity around implementing the recommendations of EHRC, but also on the flip side, do you think there is still an issue of some on the left not coming to terms with the genuine hurt and distress that many yeah. Jews feel I, inside yeah. and outside the Labour Party about anti-Semitism. I think we have to be honest with ourselves that I think there was a complete underestimation of the pain within the Jewish community. Um, and we have to acknowledge that. And, and I think a number of us have. I think, and I try to do that in every conversation I have about this issue now, you start from the base of actually acknowledging the pain and also saying that, you know, if you're not a member of the Jewish community, you, it's very difficult to fully understand it. So you've got to listen to the Jewish community on, on, on that. That's that's the first step. So I think we have, and I think we have largely admitted it. For those people who haven't come to terms with it, I'm not sure if they ever will. And that's why we've said they're the sort of people that we don't want in our party. If they don't acknowledge this issue, um, you know, it's not, it's not, I keep saying, it is about, isn't about the numbers, it's about the pain. And I think that's the way in which you can then at least then start to move on. But the way in some ways, the HRC report, I thought was it was going to come out, be published. And when I read it, I thought it's fair enough. These recommendations look all right to me. Let's get on with it. So the controversy around Jeremy now is just, meant is the, the, the attention has moved away from the implementation to this, I just think, blunder, the overreaction to a few of the words that Jeremy spoke. I just wish we could get back on to dealing with the, the real issue now. Um, and the real issue is anti-Semitism. I think also we've got to learn lessons. We've just seen the report 
from the Labour Muslim Network about Islamophobia as well. We've got to deal with that. And so there's so much on the agenda that we can get on with rather than arguing about procedural rules around Jeremy's, whether he's a member of the Parliamentary Labour Party or not. I mean, Jeremy aside, you mentioned Delma Walker, your former uh, mm. personal private uh, secretary, uh, a Labour MP who lost the seat at the last election. She's, she's quit. Various councillors have quit uh, the party as well. And some on the left would say, look, game over. The people at the top of the Labour Party want the left out. Uh, there's going to be, to quote Stuart Hall from the early 80s, it's now the great moving right show. There's no chance the left will ever be allowed to come anywhere near the top of the party again. Lots of the campaign group have already quit from the top over various bits of legislation the Labour Party's abstained on. What would you say to them? They would say, game over. I would say go back six years, go back six years, and the left were meant to be encased by Peter Mandelson in a sealed tomb, never to emerge again. Um, five years ago, we took the leadership of the Labour Party. Simple as that. Things change, and they can change remarkably um, quickly as well. And often change isn't always predictable. So we've. my view is that if we can maintain the scale of membership that we had, if we can ensure that that membership is fully engaged in the discussion of the world that it is, the sort of changes that are needed, the radical programme that we can advocate, we can use the democratic mechanisms of the Labour Party to ensure the policy programme is consolidated and to ensure that we have elected representatives that will be willing to go into government to implement it. But the Labour Party has always been, you know, to use the language, it's always been a terrain of struggle, hasn't it? It's always been um, a battle of ideas and a battle of organisation as well. And I keep reminding people, when the Labour Party was established, it, it was liberals, it was social reformers, it was socialists, and there was a Marxist com com element of that, and a tendency within that as well. There's trade unionists who just had straightforward economistic demands. It was trade unionists who had in their constitution of their trade unions the, the, the radical transformation of society to create a socialist society. So it's always been that broad church. And at different times in its history, different coalitions have dominated both in terms of ideas and organisation. And we saw that. We, we've seen that right the way through, but we saw it after the Second World War with the Attlee government. We saw it with some of the elements of the Wilson reform, the battle between left and right to try to reform through. And then we saw it um, under under Blair. We saw the battles between Blair and Brown around issues around child poverty and how you act against that, and also the issues around the war as well. And then when Ed Miliband was in place, uh, again, those same tussles. When Jeremy got elected, Jeremy was a reflection of what was happening in the real world. People wanted radical change after all those years of austerity. And they wanted a, a Labour Party that was quite clearly anti-austerity, but also they were open to more radical change that would then embed, if you like, some of the socialist principles upon which our party was founded within policy and then going into government to enable that to happen. Now, I think that time can come again. I actually think the battle over ideas and policies over the over the next 18 months or so in the run up to the preparations for the next general election is going to be one of the key periods in the Labour Party's history. I actually think we can win that battle. I call it a battle, but you know what I mean, the debate. I think we can win that debate around the ideas. And I think actually we, if we ensure that we mobilise effectively and we ensure that people don't leave the party, but we use every device we possibly can to raise these issues, put forward our radical solutions. Actually, I think we can, yeah, I think we can win out. I can think we can consolidate the left within the Labour Party for another generation. I actually think we may be able to consolidate the Labour Party as a vehicle for socialism for another generation as well. We we both voted for Rebecca Long Bailey, so we were on mm. the losing side. But Keir Starmer's mandate, if you like, was based on uh I suppose the reason people voted for him were the three main reasons, because a lot of people who voted for Corbyn's wise voted for Starmer, of course. That's how he won. And the three reasons were a united party, competence, and 10 pledges, a kind of radical yeah. agenda, including hiking taxes on the rich, 
scrapping tuition fees, green industrial revolution, no illegal wars, common ownership. Has yeah. he stopped with the mandate? Uh, well, the, one of the reasons people voted for um, Keir Starmer, um, understandably, is that it was that I think in people's minds there was a compromise between, yes, they wanted a radical program still, but they wanted to win election. It's understandable. They would just lost an election. And, and, and it was a bit like, it was a bit like 92, 93 into 94. Um, we'd lost a series of elections. Kinnock went and John Smith became the leader. Now, John Smith was the sort of, um, he was sort of centre right at best, but actually everyone liked him. I really liked him because he was straight down the line. This is what I believe in. But I, I, I understand where you're coming from. Let's see where how we can go forward, that sort of thing. He was a Labour person. Um, and I think he would have won. If he was still alive, he would have won in 97 and um, with the same sort of majority, if not more, to be honest. But what, when he died, there was a sort of a period in, in, in a very similar period. You'd lost a series of elections. A new leadership was needed. And people voted for Blair because they saw, they thought, well, this is someone who can win. Uh, and interestingly enough, at that point in time, if people forget this, just how some of Blair's statements at the time Quite left wing, you know. It was almost CND on issues. So you hard to put that back. I mean, obviously, that was for opportunist reasons. But anyway, I think after the after we lost the election last year, people wanted a winner. That was it, and they saw Keir uh, as someone who could win the election. And there is a bit of um, that sort of traditional: what, who can win the election in this country? And what do they do? They choose a white man in a suit who's a lawyer. You know, they think that's the sort of person that might be able to appeal to more people than a radical young young woman. I think that's completely wrong. But that's in the psychology, the psyche of some of our members, unfortunately, still. So therefore, they vote for Keir. He argues he's the unity candidate, etc., which is fair enough. And he commits himself to the programme. The issue now is as we move forward into this coming period, is that commitment going to be translated into hard policy and then hard manifesto commitments? Interestingly enough, from what I hear, and I, you know, I'm, you're peeping through keyholes and, and um, letterboxes because I'm not a member of the shadow cabinet, but from what I hear in the shadow cabinet, um, some of the economic papers that have been brought forward, not by Annelise Dodds, I think she's pretty radical, but some of the economic papers that have been brought forward by officers, etc have been thrown out and radicalised. And the debate has been going on that no matter what people thought a number of years ago, the situation is tr transformed within our society so much for Labour to be elected, they have to be radical because radical solutions are needed. And, you know, it's radical solutions as a result of 10 years of austerity. Radical solutions because the pandemic has acted like a pressure test on our economy and our politics. It's revealed all the weaknesses, the incompetences, the, the way in which the, the system isn't working for people and delivering on a whole range of fronts and the need, the sort of radical solutions that are needed. But in addition to that, you then have, my God, the existential threat of climate change and the sense of urgency building within society that if we don't tackle it, um, we've lost, we've lost the planet basically. So. I think that even within the debate now, within Keir's shadow cabinet and elsewhere within the PLP, there's a recognition that actually you do need a radical policy program. And increasingly, we've got to build upon that. And at the same time, we've got to hold them to account within the party. That's why leaving the party is such a mistake, because you then you lose all the, you, you lose your say. You're no longer in the game. You're no longer even to, able to shout at them within a party meeting you're outside the building you lose the opportunity to hold them to account in terms of the way in which policy will be developed and then enacted in government so i still think it's all to play for i actually think the way in which um, the economy the way in which the the politics of this country um reflecting what's happened after years of austerity and the pandemic i think it's going our way and it's interesting, the only way that the Tories think that they can survive is doing what they did in the general election, stealing some of our policies in, in language, in, in expressions of policy, but not really either being committed to implementing them or implementing them on a scale 
that's needed to address the real issues in society and completely refusing to tackle the distribution of wealth and power in our society. So no, I think it's all to play for. I actually think that also the left, as I say, we've got this architecture of think tanks. We've got this new generation coming through who are extremely articulate and sophisticated in the way in which they analyze things. I think that we've got the, the left that can win these arguments, can organize and can develop them in a way which um, creates hegemony. It's the old Gramsci thing. It's creating a climate of opinion which is almost unstoppable. I think that's the potential we have now. I mean, if, I know this may be a bit negative, but if the leadership doesn't commit to the 10 pledges or doesn't abide by the 10 pledges, what, what then? What, would you, what, what will happen in terms of the left and the leadership? It's a fight, well, it's, it's, it's a fight within the party, isn't it? You know, it's a, a battle within the party. And so the left then, well, what we'll want is uproar, won't we? We'll want to say, look, you were elected on this platform. These are the policies that not, it isn't, this is real world stuff now as well. This isn't about, you know, fight one group fighting another within the Labour Party or whatever for fun. This is about the survival of the planet. This is about making sure everyone has a decent roof over their heads. This is about making sure people no longer have to, uh, in a family, for example, we've seen so many examples of this where some parents aren't eating so their children can be fed. You know, we're, t we're talking about such fundamental issues now. It isn't a battle between who wins or loses in the party. This is a battle around some fundamentals. So we're, we'll be saying on, in the party itself, these are the policies that are desperately needed by the whole of society, but these are the policies that are particularly needed by our class and therefore, we will campaign for them within the party and we expect them to be delivered. And if there's any reneging on that, well, we'll want that debate. And as I say, I think it would be uproarious because people think these matters are so serious now. You know, I don't I'm I just come to it from my experience within my own community. You know, we've got a housing crisis like we've never seen before since the Second World War. And we've got overcrowding. We've got homelessness. We've got. Um, people who, you know, who, who literally are working all hours God send just to pay the rent or the mortgage. You know, it's, it's just the situation we're in at the moment. The levels of child poverty, I never, ever thought we'd see this again within our society. And we're seeing, as a result of that, I have to say now, particularly since the, the pandemic, we're seeing levels of stress and distress and mental health challenges um, go through the roof. Um, so... This is a serious debate that we've got to win because it's more than just winning an argument within a political party. It's about it's about the very survival of our communities. And um, this week I wrote a column about the Grenfell disaster in which I approvingly quoted what you said uh, two and a half years ago or three and a half years ago, uh, that it was social murder, the deaths of 72 people. And we've already heard at the inquiry uh, horrific evidence uh, um, about yeah. how avoidable it was and the, and the alleged role of, 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 for example, the company that provided the cladding. But but what what I'm asking is, I mean, that, in my view, you correctly described that social murder. We're in the middle of a pandemic, the worst crisis since World War II, where the government delayed lockdown. Uh, they then opened up the economy without a functioning test and trace system because they handed it to private contractors. They said, go back to work or you'll lose your job, reopen the schools. The universities and the University Colleges Union uh, made it clear that getting over a million students to travel across the country to, uh, you know, from different parts of the country to other parts of the country was just asking for a second wave, which of course then happened. Given we've got the worst death toll in the country, going by excess deaths, about 75,000 people now, which is about one in every 887 Britons have died during the pandemic and a few in a space of a few months, how do we describe? I mean, you said Grenfell was social murder. How would we describe those? Deaths? I think, I think it's okay. On on Grenfell, when I said social murder, social murder was developed as a con concept from Engels onwards, um, and then you realise that actually, when you, you're using language that people don't fully appreciate, so actually, what it enabled me to do, having used that expression. Despite the shock horror, the condemnation I was getting from all, a whole range of media outlets as well as individuals who should have known better, 
what it did enable me to do is actually then develop the discussion around what social murder really is. And and interestingly enough, when I met the um, a lot of the Grenfell residents, um, they were all completely supportive. They said, actually, you were right, Com- completely right. You gave us a little bit of a an element of language that we could then express our views on it as well. So that I was I was I was pleased that it resonated with the people that that mattered really on this. I think what we've seen now is criminal negligence, um, where advice has been given to experts from experts to government ministers, and the government ministers have overridden that advice, and as a result of that, people have died and others have suffered badly, and it's affected whole families and, and communities. So I think it is criminal negligence. And I, I've said this before, I won't forgive them for what they've done. I will not forgive them because if you look at the, i just give one example, shall I? In my constituency, the care homes, what we know now that people, despite all the advice, were being discharged from hospital into care homes, even though they were infected. Okay, that happened. I was scrambling around um, on behalf of one care home just to get basic PPE um, to the staff. Um, and they'd ordered it. Some had come, not in, nowhere near enough, a tenth of what they needed. I'm phoning round different agencies, trying to get hold of ministers to, you know, what's happening. And at the same time, Hancock is getting up, Secretary of State for Health is getting up in Parliament, saying how wonderful the government is performing, how wonderful things are. And as a result of that, Literally, my constituents' lives were put at risk. Um, we don't fully know the consequences as a result. Of that. The same happened on testing. Um, the government introduced a procedure whereby relatives could visit, but the staff would be tested every week and the residents would be start tested every month. We couldn't get the test kits. And yet at the same time, I'm listening to um, Matt Hancock on um, interviews on TV and in the Commons Chamber, explaining the millions that have been delivered and produced, etc. No, they weren't. It was complete lies. And so I think yeah, there is criminal negligence. And at some stage, I would like some of these ministers to be brought to book. That's why I actually do support having an a independent public inquiry into what happened. And that should range across what advice was provided, what decisions were taken, the timeliness of those decisions, and the consequences of one inappropriate decisions and wrong decisions being taken or decisions being taken too late. I'd like to know the exact consequences of that. And I would like, I would like the individual ministers to be held to account in that way. You know, the, I just, I do think, I do, th- I know you've raised this before as well. I do actually think they did think that they would have a, a herd immunity strategy. I really do think that now. And I think it was madcap at the time. And I actually also think that um, in all the advice that they were getting about timing of lockdowns, et cetera, they thought um, they could say, and it most probably was ideological about, uh, you know, their concept, what they believe is freedom uh, of the individual, et cetera. And I, I most probably was ideological. It went against the grain of what some of them stand for the sort of free market approach to everything. Um, But I just think when you're a minister, you have responsibilities and your responsibility is to take the best advice and to implement it and be open and transparent about it and be accountable for it. Uh, That never happens. So, yeah, criminal negligence as far as I'm concerned. You mentioned the climate emergency and we are running out of time to save our species, the planet. Quite a big issue, I would say. I mean, Boris Johnson... Just announced a green industrial revolution. These are your words. This is in the Labour manifesto. Mm, yeah. you should be well done, Boris Johnson. This is great. Celebrate. There we go. You might have ripped off uh, the policies. Uh, what would you say to that? Well, the best example, though, and isn't it, is that the amount of money he's announced um, for this um, green initiative this week is less than he's just announced the spending on the military. <laughs> so. It's a pittance in comparison what's needed. Um, I went through my um, sort of Damascene conversion on climate change as a result of climate camp turning up in my constituency when we were campaigning against the third runway. And despite lots of reading about climate change, it was actually sitting around in those seminars that were taking place during climate camp 
that I really kind of got a full understanding from movement activists about one, the nature of potential climate change, the urgency of it, but then also the need for a social movement to be linked to policy making and then the opportunity of government playing its role. Um, and that's what motivated me. And, and I just came out of that climate camp absolutely convinced now this was number one priority that we naturally needed to get, to get on with it. And that's why in my team, if you remember, Becky Long Bailey was my number two. She was my chief secretary and she was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And when she, when we needed to, we moved her over, uh, and she took responsibility for secretary, as shadow secretary of state for Bayes business. And her, her whole operation was all about how do we transform our our economy to tackle climate change. And some of the program, the advisory groups she set up were, were fantastic. A whole range of real expertise. I brought Extinction Rebellion into as well to to brief um, my treasury team and others and Becky's team too. And Again, so I thought we were we were developing policies which were, I suppose you'd call them radical, but they were they were blindingly obvious. You know? <laughs> we just had to end fossil fuel dependency, full stop. Um, we had to prevent investment in fossil fuels. So not just preventing government investing, but also pre preventing the private sector. And for me, for example, the simple thing of doing that is just, you know, in terms of the companies that were listed on the London Stock Exchange, they sign up to ending their, their subsidy or their investment in fossil fuels. And if they didn't, you didn't have them listed on the stock exchange. It was me who brought forward the, the revision of the Bank of England, the advice that was given in terms of um, lending. In addition to that, I, I put together a team of ex-civil servants, ex-treasury civil servants and others to work through what we did with regard to the Treasury, how we could green the Treasury. And one of the things that um, Bob Kurzak, who was head of civil service before, was part of that team. And they came up with um, the Green Book. The Green Book, well, it's not green, environmentally green, it's just colour green, but it was the, the Green Book was the advice that was given by which um, individual projects or expenditure were assessed. So we immediately rewrote that and inserted into that that the number one priority was everything was assessed about whether or not it would create sustainability. Um, so that whole program um, was radical, but actually it was based upon really solid advice from experts in the field, people who'd been in government to implement policies and how best to do it. And it was just common sense. It was just absolute common sense. So that program, if we'd have been in government from 2017, we would have been in our third year of implementation and I actually think, you know, the 2050 target was never really a, pro a real target um, because it was too late. I actually, you know, I was arguing, you know, maybe we should be shooting for 2030, you no know, later than 2040 and zero, um, net zero carbon. So I actually think we most probably would have been there. Things like individual projects were ready to go, you know. <laughs> In terms of alternative fuel sources, people used to pull my leg because I'm a scouser, but um, Stevie Rotherham wanted to build a barrage across the uh, Mersey to create wave power. It was just ready to go. It just needed a couple of billion to get on with it. And it would have been the model that we could have used right the way around the coast as well. And I even had the site. Well, Becky did it. Actually, Becky did the work. And we had the sites that we would have for the battery production that was needed in the, in this country. And we literally knew where we were going to put them and what the cost would be the skills that were needed. And we had the skills training program. Becky did the work about the nature of the skills program. So it was all ready to go. It was it was like I, I compared it to the sort of martial aid program after the Second World War, a bulk of money going into it, but extremely well planned and, and over a period of time would have transformed our economy. What we get now is um, a minuscule in terms of program that Boris Johnson had brought forward. It's all well and good to get the headlines, but it doesn't really, it just scrapes the surface of tackling the you know, climate change in a way that needs to be done effectively. Infuriating, really, because we could be so much further on. But more than that, it's maddening because it's, it's, putting, our, it's putting our climate at risk. And when you look across at America and you see what's happening there, or you look at in, the, in terms of the global south with the flooding, et cetera, you think, my God, 
don't people realize that isn't why haven't they got the same sense of urgency as the rest of us and it's because apart from just the mentality you know their ideological trap that they're in it is because actually we are challenging their power base we are challenging the distribution of power and wealth um, so of course they're naturally going to turn a blind eye to policies that will, will challenge that at all but also they'll oppose them too they're so linked to the existing system and that existing system is so linked to uh, um, well basically uh, the undermining of our planet and the ripping out of the resources and raw materials of our planet that they can't break from it. Um, Trump's out, Biden's in, but interestingly, the so-called squad in the US Congress of of left-wing Congress people, most notably in the first wave, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, but also Ilan Omar, that that squad has virtually been doubled now. So you've got the likes, for example, of Cory Bush. We've got another man, a first gay black guy elected uh, to Congress in in from New York. What's the significance of of the revival of the American left? I mean, using the term American left is not something we're generally accustomed to doing. And and what lessons can we learn from them? Okay, you know, I'm doing. I've been doing for a number of months this um, project around claim the future, which is sort of bringing experts, policy experts together with campaigners who are also policy experts, just bringing people together to look at um, an economic program for the future. And we've just published our, our um, a booklet on that. So about, it's about claiming the future for a radical program on addressing the real issues that people face. Part of that, um, we did it a couple of weeks ago, is that we've linked up with a number of American comrades, American activists, and we started a couple of weeks ago after the Biden election. Uh, we had Naomi Klein leading on it, but we had a number of people linked link to Jacobin, linked to the Democratic Socialists of America and other groups to talk through issues of common concern, issues that we have to address together, and then learning lessons about how we develop our ideas, but all, as importantly, how do we organize on the ground? You know, the Labour Party has always said we're an internationalist party, but we're an internationalist party that rarely talks to people from other countries. And the link between the American left and the UK left, and this is self-criticism, here, is, has not been strong and developed in the way it should have been. So the idea now is that we're bringing activists together to talk to one another from the US and UK about those common issues and common campaigns. And then maybe develop that into much more of a structured network that we can go forward on in the future. The lesson so far for me um, is that, you know, Biden uh, Biden could have been a potential disaster this election. You know, the scale of support for Trump demonstrates just uh, how you can create um, false consciousness amongst working the working class at the moment in America uh, as a result of the control of the media, et cetera, and the information flow. But what Biden came, you know, despite everything that was said in the polls about his lead, he came very close to losing it in individual states. And it was only in a you know, place like Pennsylvania where he pulled it off or on the ground in particular areas on the organization of the left. And what I was amazed at, and the, the, our left comrades are telling us, is Biden didn't even replicate the, the organization on the ground that Obama had. And then if it wasn't for the, the left activists, socialists and uh, active trade unions working on the ground in a number of states, he would have lost. So the lesson there is actually this is about movement politics uh, and it's about building the political movement as a real genuine social movement, addressing the issues, day-to-day -day issues that people are facing, but also then lifting their, their views to a vision of an alternative society. So they're the sort of lessons that, that we need to learn. In terms of political representation as well, you know, the, there's a recognition of the left in America that, yeah, you can have social movements, you can have campaigns around individual issues, but actually you've got to have alongside that the challenging for electoral positions as well. And so that, again, uh, sometimes in the left in Britain, you, they said, oh, I'm fed up with the Labour, I'll go and do something on an individual campaign. The argument is actually you do both. You've got to engage in that social movement development and then that social movement you need to ensure engages with electoral politics as well. And I think that's what's happened over there. The, the one thing that, 
let me just throw this in. It might be tangential, Owen. I'm sorry about this, but one of the projects I, I want to get involved in now, uh, working with Madeline Williams, who uh, was my chief of staff, the discussion we're having is about how do you develop a narrative and how do you effectively communicate that? And what are the resources you need and what are the platforms that are available to us? And how can we bring together networks of people who can develop narratives and can effectively communicate with them? There's such, there's such huge talent out there at the moment working in a whole range of different fields. And it isn't just mainstream media or social media. It's also cultural engagement as well. Now, I think, you know, we developed, well, you were involved in this anyway. We developed up until 2017 <clears throat> new ways of communicating. We reinstated word of mouth with all our rallies and whatever under Jeremy. We also um, dominated, I think, uh, political debate on social media after 2017. Then the right and the reactionary forces recognized that. So between 17 and 19, um, they invested such scale of resources and organization in social media in particular. They'd already Cap captured mainstream media because they owned it. They captured broadcast media to a large extent, but they also then captured and colonized um, social media. Now, what we've got to do is recognize that and now start thinking, hang on, how do we start communicating, developing a narrative and communicating again? What platforms are available to us? How do we establish new platforms and new bases of communication? I also think we did lose out on, I think we lost out in terms of cultural communication as well. I was expecting a lot more music and drama and dance and performance art to come out of um, the last few years. To a certain extent, it has, but not on the scale that we need. So I think that's a huge debate to have now. And actually, it's quite an enjoyable one as well. You, you can enjoy the art forms that you need to develop in that way. I actually think humour is a, a great asset as well. So there's a whole debate about developing an art. And in America, there's lots of lessons to learn from how they've done that. You know, OAC statements and videos and films and all the rest of it communicate an idea like that. And you work, you walk away from it and think, Why did, God, that's so simple a concept. Why didn't I think of that? And then it lands with you. So there's lots of, I think, lots of talented initiatives that we, we can link up with, with our American comrades. Um, getting rid of Trump is such a huge break. Well, he hasn't gone yet. Um, you, never know what's going to, you never know what's going to happen. But winning that election to get rid of him was such a huge breakthrough. We all breathed a sigh of relief. But then in talking to people like Naomi Klein and others, they said, fine, breathe a sigh of relief, but recognize what we've got on our hands now. And what they've got on our hands, it's a more difficult for them to a certain extent, is the Democratic Party and the Biden administration. Bernie, Bernie Sanders is obviously trying to do the best he can to accommodate to that and influence it as much as possible. But I think there'll be as many struggles within the, the left and Democrat Party um, uh, and the wider left within America <clears throat> as there are in this, in our party here, about making sure that the electoral leadership represents both the arguments that are being put forward, but also the policies that are really needed for radical change. So we're in a very similar position overall. So so lastly, John, lastly, in terms of you, how do you see your role in the coming months, <laughs> years ahead? I say that in the context, let's be honest, look, the left knows how to have a Barney with itself. And not only is the left in a bit of a defensive posture, it's got divisions on past issues like Brexit. It's got divisions on anti-Semitism in terms of how to confront it. It's got divisions over its, the relationship with the Labour leadership. How do you see your role in the coming period in terms of maybe trying to bridge some of those divides? And what would your your advice be to potentially warring factions of the left? <laughs> What's my role? My role at the moment is to be blamed for everything. But there you are. <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't mind. I don't mind that. Punch you bag, have to use the punch bag. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't mind that. I think sometimes you just, you know, you just have to ride, ride with the punches, don't you, really? Um, I, after the loss of the general election, um, and I said, and I wasn't joking, I said, I'm going to be an elder statesman now. I want to assume the role of an elder statesman who can um, draw upon um, experience, provide advice and assistance as much as possible, 
but also listen to people and bring people together, network them, bring coalitions together on the left, um, work, work on individual campaigns, but then put together uh, those individual campaigns as much as possible to develop an overall approach and an overall political program. So that's my role now. Um, and also do what I've always done is I'm an activist. You know, that there's lots of people, uh, I used to say, you know, lots of left MPs would tour around the country doing speeches on platforms and all the rest of it. And, and halfway through the, uh, the last period, I said, I'm not doing that anymore. It's, I don't do stand up anymore. I don't go along, just do the stand up speech and off you go. Nothing comes of it. What we've got to do now is by all means, the oratory is important. That's the most important element of it is take that oratory and the ideas and turn them into practice on the ground. So that the work, the root, I, I have a great admiration for people. They're unsung heroes, really, who do the routine work as well as engage in the debates and discussions. So part of my role now, I see, is getting involved in as many activist campaigns as I possibly can. And after the pandemic, you'll see me back on the picket lines, back on the demonstrations and occupations, because that's where the debates need to feature. You know, we every, so it is a bit like climate camp. Climate camp was an important form of active activity, but it also brought together, you know, the concept of practice, theory and practice. You discuss what's the theory behind what you're doing and the issues that you confront, the policies you need, and then you translate that into activist practice. So that's what I'll be doing. The key aspect of it is, though, you're right, it is about bringing people together. It is about trying to hold things together to make sure people recognize the role that they could play, the power that they have, but also, you know, to be serious, the responsibility that they have on their shoulders as well. Um, and we all have. We have to, you know, we just have to take those responsibilities seriously that, you know, we're faced with climate change crisis. We're, changed, we're faced with levels of inequality grotesque levels of inequality within our society and we're faced with effectively what has been a proto-fascist regime in, in Boris Johnson. So the responsibility now is for us to work together, build the, the biggest coalition we possibly can to tackle those issues. So that's, that's, that's I think that's my job. Um, and also to try, I suppose really, I suppose really to try and convince people no matter how frustrated they are um, actually every time we get knocked down we have to pick ourselves up and go and go forward and that's it and actually in doing that you know you only have a short life but you well enjoy it you know let's enjoy this struggle let's not you know we, we're winning we're winning the battle of ideas we're we're winning we may you know we lost the last general election but blimey within months we had picked ourselves up and we were back on the campaign trail again. Um, yeah, so I suppose the general theme of everything I'm doing now is establishing what solidarity really means in practice within our movement and within our community. John, I actually feel pretty teared up. I was going to, before this conversation, just sit in the corner rocking in the fetal position. But now I feel a little bit more lifted. <laughs> Maybe it'll all be okay. We'll all live happily ever after. It'll all be fine. I still will always be haunted. I remember poor, you know, Ash Sarkov, a very close friend of mine. I still remember that moment, the exit poll, and just sitting there, the cameras focused on us as though we were kind of in the dock. Uh, and you just it was that moment of just feeling like you're just falling into the abyss. All hope is gone. But you remind us that we have clawed our way back the left, but there's there's a there's a way to go. But there there is always hope. Don't knock the fetal position every now and again, though. <laughs> well, <laughs> some wisdom and also some optimism there from John McDonald, which I think is much needed in these unsettling, disturbing, and often, let's be honest, quite bleak times. I'd love to hear your thoughts, so do leave your comments below the line. Now, if you want us to keep making these videos, and we've got a lot of videos to come then you can do one or two things, or both. Uh, firstly, if you've got any cash lying around, Patreon slash Owen Jones 84, that enables this to expand, to keep hiring and paying people union wages to take on the right-wing media during this nightmare of an era in which we live. And also, go to the YouTube main page, on my page that is, click the bell to uh, get notifications so you always know when a video comes up. We've got a lot to come, from Piers Morgan to Yanis Varoufakis. So don't say I'm not spoiling you. 
Also, of course, every week, 5 p.m., the show. We've got very eclectic guests this week. We're going to make, particularly as lockdown permits, some absolutely epic videos, which I think you're going to like very much. I'll see you next time.